Hello and welcome to my talk on source distance perception with reverberant spatial audio object reproduction of real rooms. I'm Philip Jackson and this work was done together with Sandeep Chitreddy in the S3A project at the University of Surrey in the UK. The outline of my talk begins looking at sound source distance perception um, and the encoding in terms of the reverberant spatial audio object which we used to encode a number of real rooms, and then we investigated in this experiment how that was able to cue source distance. Uh, so we tested it over a range of different conditions um, and used a multiple stimulus interface in order to gather ratings from our participants. So, of course, I'll provide an analysis of the results and the main trends and also the key findings and future perspectives in the summary. This begins with the room impression and starting from a spatial room impulse response um, we can see what the main components of this are. So I've got in plan view a cartoon of a sound source and a listener and an impulse response that will build up up above. The direct sound comes in, takes precedence and indicates the source direction. In those early reflections um, we enhance the loudness and clarity of the sound and give some cues to those key reflecting surfaces we have a diffuse sound field in that late tail that creates a sense of envelopment, source distance, and also some cues to the room side. So it's this source distance effect that we're interested in testing and exploiting in this work, motivated primarily by spatial audio applications in entertainment, to be able to give some depth uh, in the experiences. And we know that the uh, level of the direct sound can provide some uh, information to the relative distance of sound sources. But indoors, the reverberation helps to provide an absolute distance cue that we wish to investigate. There are other cues besides for larger distances, the absorption of air at high frequencies as an effect, and there are near field and dynamic cues too. But we were motivated by the fact that Varying reverb parameters in spatial audio reproduction um, has the capability to modify the apparent room size envelopment um, and source distance. And what we wanted to investigate was whether directly encoding parameters uh, from real rooms at a range of different distances um, could show that those parameters are capable of encoding that distance information. So we use this reverberant spatial audio object representation um, that splits the impulse response to uh, the early part, which is considered coherent and localizable, um, and encodes that information in terms of uh, level and time and direction of arrival information, primarily. And then the late part, where we have an analysis in frequency bands of how the energy decays over time. Looking at some measurements across different distances, uh, we can see initially how some of the early reflections are encoding information about distance. So you can see, for example, the direct sound uh, getting later and decaying just after it. This strong early reflection has a delay uh, that is reducing over time. But also there's a back wall reflection and there are other patterns in these early reflections that we wanted to capture as part of that information. Also, of course, there was the late reverberation part. And to test our encoding of this, we took the original information in the late tail and analyzed it in terms of its frequency bands to get our decay parameters and energies. Um, and then we used that to render a synthesized spectrogram of the same thing. And then in order to validate our procedure, we took that synthesized spectrogram, estimated the parameters again, and then resynthesized a new version of that late tail. So once we were happy with that process, we then went ahead to with our main goal to test the efficacy of this um, object-based representation, creating apparent source distance. So the research questions mainly, can this reverberant spatial audio object cue source distance um, and convey this effect of perceptual distance and then how do the perceived distances relate to the encoded physical distances? To do this, we used a couple of different room data sets of measurements. So one data set of B-format RIRs from the University of London um, gave us measurements across a, a wide range of different distances in a classroom. Another room was the Octagon Hall, which also provided a, a nice range of distances that we used as our 
two test rooms. And then we also used the um, Pori Hall from Helsinki as uh, providing some reference distances. So our experimental settings considered two different localizable sources, a drum sound and a voice from the Archimedes data set. And these two test rooms provided us a, a range of 10 different distances uh, in each case for the classroom here from one meter to five and a half meters and the octagon hall from two to 11 meters. With the anchors, the references from the Pori Hall chosen to cover that overlapping region in the middle to set the scale of the ratings. We encoded, of course, with this reverberant spatial audio object encoding, um, and the reproduction was done over a 42.1 loudspeaker setup shown here in our audio booth. And the rendering was done with the Visor VST plugin from the S3A project. OK, so the ratings were gathered by asking participants to rate how far away a sound appeared across those different test conditions uh, and gathered using this uh, Max MSP interface uh, on a kind of multi-stimulus presentation on each page, which was determined for a particular room and a particular source on each page. And so we had four different pages. And on each page, the distances were randomly ordered for these 10 different stimuli to be rated and the scale was set by these anchors for near and far at the two different distances in the Pori Hall. We recruited uh, over 20 audio researchers to participate in the experiments and so the first question was did they provide reliable results? So we had a look at the repetition error from the repeat trial that they did on each page to see how consistent their values were and so here uh, we have the RMS repetition error for the two different rooms in red and blue with the uh, summary in black across different participants for the drums on top and for the voice below. And overall, they were reasonably consistent. And on average, uh, the majority were below 20 points in terms of repetition error. Breaking it down across the classroom and the octagon, in fact, we saw quite similar patterns of error in both cases. And looking at distance, we saw no systematic pattern and were pleased that the error, in fact, was rather consistent across all distance measurements. In terms of source, the drums and the voice were generally similar. There were kind of variations of plus or minus one or two points in the overall uh, summary statistic. But we also found that a few participants, such as these highlighted in green at the top here, um, did report higher errors. And so we investigated whether removing those, screening those uh, participants out of the data analysis affected the results. Um, but actually, they had very little influence overall on the key findings. And so we've left all of those in in the following analysis. So what are the main trends? Well, shown here, I've got the ratings of perceived distance against physical distance uh, for the classroom on the left and the octagon on the right. The top graphs show a break, breakdown of the drums and voice um, in these error bars, whereas on the bottom the results are combined. Also shown is a log distance curve through the anchors as a uh, reference for both of these, um, and the magenta dash dot line shows the actual physical loudspeaker radius in the reproduction setup. And we can see the main trend is that we have uh, ratings of perceived distance increasing with the physical distance, uh, with a few exceptions that we'll look at in a bit more detail in a moment. And an ANOVA with a multi-factor mixed effects model also confirmed an effect for distance, as well as an interaction for distance and room. In terms of source, we saw that the uh, voice was a three to four points higher than the drums, um, which is perhaps due to some loudness prior or directivity effect in the recording. With the distance, we saw in general an initial rise that tended to saturate um, further beyond the room radius. And looking in a bit more detail in each of the two rooms, um, in the classroom we have this anomalous point where this virtual source at one meter was in fact closer than the physical loudspeaker positions in the reproduction setup. And so it looks as if it collapsed onto the physical loudspeakers. But in the other cases we have this steep rise of the perceived distance and then a gentler rise with a low score here at five. And for the octagon, again, we have a steep rise and a gentler rise um, and a low score this time at around eight. 
So we were interested to, te to test whether there were perceptually distinct distances from these results, and a paired t-test of comparing each of these indicates in yellow a great number of statistically significant differences. In many cases they were different, um, but we did find some uh, clusters uh, where there were um, values that were not distinct one from another in both cases. Nevertheless, there were a number of points where we could get a distinct number of ratings in both cases, um, giving us uh, five to six distinct distances in each route. Looking at the distance trends in a bit more detail, we first wanted to compare this effect against the one anticipated from the direct to reverberant ratio. In dB, this varies with log distance, so plotted out against log distance here are the results from both rooms, the classroom and the octagon hall, and I'm indicating the just notable distance in terms of DRR. The main trend agrees very well with these results over a wide range of two and a half octaves from about one and a half meters here to ten meters, although we do see some some kind of peak curvature here in each case and in order to examine that property in a bit more detail we aligned these two results on their peak curvature points which also coincided with the anchor positions. Aligning those one on top of the other we see a very good agreement between the two curves which both have this steep initial rise and a gentler gradient thereafter, except for this anomalous one meter point. So in summary, yes, the RSAO can convey different distances of virtual sounds, um, and it's effective over the range of about 1.5 to 10 meters, and the results were generally within the JND of the direct to reverberant ratio. We saw that the perceived distance increased monotonically for the vast majority of points with a few notable exceptions. For this point at one meter the virtual distance um, collapsed onto the reproduction loudspeakers and we overestimated the perceived distance at around the point of this peak curvature um, in both rooms. Also there were a few outliers suggesting some variability in the measurements and the encoding or the encoding. But the two rooms showed some systematic deviation from that reference line which showed that there was this steeper gradient followed um, by a gentler one, indicating a possible saturation effect. Those would be some interesting things to investigate in future. Also, we're particularly interested using this object representation of reverb to investigate whether perceptual distance can be cued consistently across different reproduction setups. Thank you very much.